my fellow true crimers. It's good to be back, and this time I am back with another unsolved true crime case for you all. It's hard to believe we are already a full month into 2023. Time is definitely flying, and we'll continue to grow with it. This is case number 12, and this is the first murder case I am covering on the channel that has multiple murdered victims involved instead of only one. I will now put up my disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes, and it's meant to spread awareness. This case absolutely breaks my heart. I wish I could say I was covering a solved true crime case today, and I desperately wish that I could say that this family has justice for what happened to them and that the person that did this to them has been confirmed and is currently rotting either in a cell or under the dirt somewhere. But as of today, when I am recording this, there are still no answers and this family has yet to get the justice that they deserve after over 20 long years. Let's go ahead and get started. This is the case of the Short Family Murders. We first have the husband and the father of the family, Michael Wayne Short. Michael was born on February 19, 1952. He grew up with one brother and two sisters. He was known for being an extremely friendly and happy-go-lucky man. One of his sisters pointed out that he at times would be very silly. She said that whenever he would be on the phone with her, he would make up and disguise his voice in almost a cartoony way while he was talking to her and pretend like it wasn't him. Michael was a very caring person and was was always known to be extremely helpful to those around him. Michael married his first wife as a young adult and together they had three sons, but ultimately this relationship didn't work out and they did get a divorce. Eventually, Michael met and quickly started a relationship with Mary Frances Hall, who becomes his second wife and is also the second victim of this case. Now known as Mary Short, was born on April 20th, 1966. She was born into a larger family as she was one of seven siblings. Both Michael and Mary grew up in the more southern rural parts of Virginia. Mary was described as sweet and neighborly, and the both of them really complimented each other because they both were just very kind people. No one ever had anything negative to say. They were just very sweet and loving people. The people who knew the couple never had a bad thing to say about them. Then on July 12th, 1993, they welcomed their one and only child together, a daughter, and who is our third victim of this case. Her name was Jennifer Renee Short. The family lived in Oak Level, Virginia, a smaller community just outside of Bassett, Virginia. Jennifer was Michael and Mary's world. They both absolutely adored their daughter, and as Jennifer started to grow up, she quickly became very attached to her parents as well. All three of them were extremely close to one another. They were a very tight-knit family. A family friend stated about the family, quote, They were good people. Quiet. They never bothered anybody as far as I know. Just down-to-earth, everyday people. Close quote. Jennifer was rarely seen without at least one of her parents by her side whenever they would go out together. Jennifer was described as such a shy and sweet little girl. A close family neighbor described Jennifer as just a bottle of joy. She would never say anything mean about anyone. She only ever had kind words to say to the people around her. She just seemed like the sweetest little ball of sunshine. Jennifer was a little bit more of a daddy's girl, which Michael absolutely loved. As she was his one and only daughter, he just loved his little girl to death. He was even known to skip work during the day sometimes just so he could be there during Jennifer's softball games. And he had no shame in this. He would let anyone know why he was skipping work for the day. He would just tell them that he was skipping to be there for his daughter during her games. It was nearing the summer's end of the year of 2002. Jennifer was just about to start her fourth grade year at Fisbro Elementary School, but Jennifer would never start the fourth grade. Michael and Mary at this time worked for MS Mobile Home Movers. Michael was the one who actually owned and managed this business. The MS stood for Michael Short. It was a company that transported mobile homes to various locations. It was the evening of August 14th, 2002. An employee of Michael's by the name of Chris Thompson was working with Michael at the Short family's home. They were working on one of the mobile home vehicles because they were planning on traveling the next day. It is not exactly known what time Chris left the Short family home that night, but it is assumed he left a little after sunset. The family did go through a Burger King drive through at around 11 p.m. that night, and this would be the last time the family is seen together and alive. We do know that the family made it back home after driving through Burger King, but not a lot is known about the events that followed and what happened to this family from midnight to the early morning hours of August 15th, 2002. Chris Thompson came back to the Shorts family home around 9 a.m. that morning. 
Him and Michael had made plans that day to travel to Christiansburg to pick up a truck for the mobile home movers business. When he got to the home, the first thing he noticed was that the garage was opened. And this wasn't odd to Chris. He figured that Michael was already awake and working on the vehicle so they could leave. Chris let himself into the garage and he saw Michael laying in the couch that was in the garage. Michael was known sometimes to fall asleep on the couch from time to time, so this wasn't abnormal either. But as Chris approached the couch, that's when he began to realize that Michael wasn't sleeping at all. Chris immediately knew that his boss was deceased and the police were immediately called to the scene. With Michael's dead body laying on the couch, the investigators quickly searched through the rest of the house and that's when they found the dead body of Mary Short in their bedroom laying in the bed. Both Michael and Mary were each shot in the head one time in what is often referred to as execution style. Michael was 50 years old and Mary was 36 years old when they were killed. They continued to search through the home and the officials quickly noticed that there was one person missing from the scene entirely and that was Michael and Mary's nine-year-old daughter Jennifer. And suddenly this wasn't just a double homicide case, it was also now a missing child's case. And for the time being, instead of focusing on the murder of her parents, the attention immediately focused 100% on finding Jennifer Short. At first, the investigators thought that maybe Jennifer heard the gunshots that night that killed her parents and that she fled the home and escaped. I think this was more of a hope than anything, honestly. They really wanted to believe that Jennifer had escaped the situation altogether. But after a couple of hours with Jennifer not showing up, this hope quickly dwindled. Once the town heard about not only Michael and Mary Short's murders, but that their nine-year-old daughter Jennifer was nowhere to be found, they immediately sprung into action and got to work desperately searching for Jennifer. An Amber Alert was launched for Jennifer in the early afternoon hours of August 15th. Since investigators didn't know exactly what time during the night the murders took place, this Amber Alert for Jennifer was extended hundreds of miles out which is a little unusual for an Amber Alert. They typically don't extend these alerts several hundred miles. It's usually more closer in proximity of where the child is last seen. The community was very hopeful at this point that Jennifer was still alive and assumed that she had been taken by whoever shot her parents that night. It actually ended up being nationwide news for Jennifer Short being missing. Her picture was being shown everywhere in the news outlets. Throughout the next couple of weeks, hundreds of volunteers and police units would join in for the search of Jennifer. I do give everyone a lot of credit for this. They did go all out trying to find her. They brought in ATVs, horses, canine units, helicopters, you name it. Everyone wanted to find Jennifer and get her back to safety. While the drastic search for Jennifer continued, other investigators did take time and effort to collecting evidence from within the crime scene of the Shorts family home. It was realized fairly early on that based on there not being any signs of struggle in either of the locations of Michael and Mary's bodies, they determined that they were both shot in the head while they were sleeping. It was also determined that the gun that was used to kill them had to be a smaller caliber firearm. This would explain why the second victim of the shooting didn't wake up when the first victim was shot, as they make far less noise. They found two .22 shell casings, one each by Michael and Mary's bodies respectively. Another thing they discovered, and I find this very interesting, is that they found that the phone lines to the home had been purposely cut, which of course sparks the thought that these murders and the potential kidnapping of a nine-year-old girl may have been premeditated. They also thoroughly searched Jennifer's bedroom, of course, and again, it doesn't seem like there was any type of struggle that occurred in the room, but some things were a little out of place. Her bed sheets were pulled back, her pillow was laying on the floor, and it was noted that her bed itself was moved two inches away from its usual spot. It is reported that approximately 66 items from the home had been taken in for evidence. These items included the two shell casings they found by Michael and Mary's bodies, a 12-gauge shotgun, a box of 12-gauge shotgun bullets, a computer disc, unidentified documents in a briefcase, a business checkbook, $600 in cash that was found on the kitchen table, a .22 caliber rifle, a partial box of rifle ammo, and a note that was left on the kitchen table, which the contents of this note have not been released as far as I can tell. So this is a lot of evidence they took in. And at this point, even 20 plus years later, to the public at least, a lot of these items that were taken still have a lot of mystery to them. The general public doesn't know the full extent of what all these items have to do with the Shorts family murder case. We can definitely only hope that the investigators who continue to work on this case have at least answered most of the questions that we all have from this. I personally would like to know what they found on the computer disk, the documents in the briefcase, and what the note on the kitchen table said. Maybe one day we will get to find out more details, but as of right now, the public doesn't have the information available to them. 
As more days passed, it was reported by a couple of witnesses that there was this white flatbed truck that had been parked outside nearby the Shorts home in the early morning hours of the murder on August 15th, 2002. It was as if whoever was inside this truck was watching the home. They released this sketch of this truck, but unfortunately, it didn't seem like this sketch brought in a lot of helpful tips in. On August 23rd, 2002, a funeral was held for Michael and Mary Short. The investigators for the case watched the funeral and its participants very closely. They even set up cameras around to see if anyone was showing any unusual behavior or giving some sort of red flags, but they did not see anything out of the ordinary during the funeral. Then on September 4th, 2002, Michael Short's remains were exhumed. And when this occurred, the rumors that had been going around in this town were ignited. As we all know, whenever a tragedy like this occurs, people begin to create their own theories on what could have happened. And there's nothing wrong with anyone coming up with potential theories. Any great investigator will look at any and every possibility. But when people start spreading these ideas or rumors as if they are facts, when there is no concrete evidence, that's when it becomes a problem. You see, very shortly when the news broke out about what happened to the Short family, a very specific rumor began to spread like wildfire across the town. And this rumor was that maybe Mary Short had been in an affair with another man, that she had cheated on Michael, and that Jennifer wasn't actually the biological daughter of Michael Short. This rumor even went as far as to say whoever Jennifer's real biological father was is the one who murdered Michael and Mary and had abducted Jennifer. So when they exhumed Michael's body, this fueled this rumor as the community believed that the reason why they were exhuming his body in the first place was to test his paternity as it related to Jennifer Short. The Henry County Sheriff at the time, H.F. Cassell, at first would refuse to acknowledge that paternity was the reason and insisted that the primary reason of the exhumation was to actually retrieve hair samples. As the investigation continued, of course, the investigators looked into other possible scenarios. It was also discovered that about 10 years prior to this case, Mary had been harassed and stalked by a man while she was working at a local industrial plant. And this man seemed like he was obsessed with Mary. There was even an incident where this guy walked into the plant looking for Mary and he had to be forcibly removed from the premises. This man, who as far as I can tell has never been publicly named, seemed to be briefly looked into by the investigators, but this never went anywhere. During this time, police also looked into Chris Thompson, the man who was Michael's employee, and had found Michael's body and contacted the police. Of course, the reason why they looked into Chris at all was the simple fact that he had been the person to discover Michael's body. They questioned him a couple of times, and he never officially became a person of interest for this case. They couldn't find anything to tie him to this crime at all, so suspicions of him were dropped pretty quickly. As more weeks passed by, everyone, the investigators, the media, the community continued to maintain finding Jennifer as the primary focus. Jennifer's family members and police officials would plea with Jennifer's abductor to release her safely so she could return back to her loved ones. Jennifer's pictures continued to be around every corner of Henry County. No one wanted to lose the hope that they had that Jennifer was still alive, but that hope would shatter on September 25th, 2002. This was about six weeks after the bodies of Michael and Mary were found. In Rockingham County, North Carolina, which is about 30 miles away from the Short family home, a man by the name of Eddie Albert was outside his home with his two dogs. The area of this home was surrounded by woods and there was a nearby creek and his dogs would go out there and play and it wasn't unusual for them to bring back items or trash from the wooded area. So one of the dogs brings back something in its mouth. At first, Eddie thinks it's some sort of turtle shell, so he grabs it out of the dog's mouth and he realizes it's not a turtle shell. It's a human skull. Eddie immediately contacts the police to report the skull that was just found. And he also told the police that about two days before his dogs brought back this skull, they had brought back what he thought was a brown haired wig and which at the time he didn't think anything of it because these dogs always brought back trash or whatever from the creek. And at the time he didn't think anything of it so he just threw this hair in the trash. The police took the skull and they also took the hair that was still in Eddie's trash and they searched the surrounding area. And that's when they found very partial remains of a child's body, which had been dumped near this creek by a rural road underneath a bridge. In addition to the skull and hair, they found some teeth, partial bone fragments, and parts of a rib cage. Out of all the pieces they found of this body, they only were ever able to find roughly a quarter of the entire skeleton. 
when news broke out that the partial remains of a child's skeleton were found due to the close proximity of the location of the remains being roughly 30 miles away from the Shorts family home. The community was fairly certain that these were the remains of nine-year-old Jennifer Short. The remains were tested, and nine days later, on October 4th, 2012, it was confirmed that these were, in fact, the remains of Jennifer Short. They concluded that her cause of death was a single small caliber gunshot wound to the head, the same as her parents, Michael and Mary. Although they were able to positively identify her cause of death, they were not able to confirm whether or not Jennifer had been sexually assaulted. It was impossible to tell due to the decomposed state of the remains and the fact that they didn't find enough of her remains to be able to tell as well. When the remains were confirmed to be that of Jennifer Short, Sheriff H.F. Caswell stated, quote, She's gone now. She's safe now. And no evil can befall her. Close quote. Once her remains were found, as you can imagine, everyone was devastated. There was just so much hope that she was going to be found alive and safe. But when she wasn't, it was very catastrophic for the community. What is so frustrating with this case is that not only do we not know who did this to this beautiful family, but we don't even know what the motive was. Once Jennifer was found, it was heavily speculated that Jennifer Short had been the primary target all along. Some believe that this was a premeditated murder, with the main goal being to kidnap Jennifer. I do think that this is very possible, but since they are unable to tell if there was any signs that Jennifer had been sexually assaulted during her abduction, this is just another speculation. But I do think it is the most likely scenario that Jennifer had been the target that this person was truly after. It just seems like such a calculated plan, doesn't it? This person cuts the phone lines, went inside the Shorts family home, shot Michael and Mary once in the head execution style, then grabbed little Jennifer from her bed and took her away into the night. It's really heartbreaking when I think about the end of Jennifer's life. I can't imagine the fear or the horrible thoughts that were probably going through her mind, being with the person who just killed her parents in cold blood. And we really don't even know how long Jennifer was alive after she was taken. They couldn't identify how old Jennifer's remains were. I don't know what type of hell this beautiful nine-year-old girl endured during her last few moments. I can only honestly hope that it was quick and as painless as possible. Obviously, being shot in the head is quick, but who knows what happened to her prior to that. After Jennifer's remains were identified a day or so later, Sheriff H.F. Cassell did confirm to the public that they did perform a paternity test when they exhumed Michael's body, but they did confirm that Michael was, in fact, the biological father of Jennifer. He stated that the reason why they did not share the results right away was the potential fear that if they did let the public know that Jennifer was, in fact, 100% Michael Short's daughter, they thought that maybe her kidnapper would harm and kill Jennifer and then dispose of her body. He did apologize to everyone the tactic upset, especially to Michael's family, who were extremely upset about the whole paternity issue because they knew Jennifer was his daughter. He stated that they were just trying to bring Jennifer home safe. So even the investigators thought maybe the rumor of Jennifer not being Michael's child was true. That's how much attention this rumor had received. During researching this case, it becomes obvious that most of the investigators involved with this case believe that Jennifer was the main target. They believe that a predator saw Jennifer and possibly became infatuated with her. And since she was never very far away from her parents and they stuck together like glue, this person planned to kill her parents to take her. A lot of people were questioned for this case. Pretty much everyone the Shorts family ever came into contact with were questioned. They focused mainly on anyone that had any contact with Jennifer specifically, like a teacher or a coach of hers. Unfortunately, these questionings didn't go anywhere, but someone would be put into the spotlight, a man that would at first be described as a material witness for this case, and he's really the only potential suspect ever to be named for this case. This man's name is Garrison Bowman, who goes by Gary. For the next several months, Gary became the main focus on this case. He was at the time a 66-year-old carpenter, there are several reasons why this man became a suspect for this case. Firstly, it was quickly discovered that Gary's mobile home was parked about a mile away from the location where Jennifer's remains were found. And they checked everywhere around where these remains were found. They looked into the owner of who this mobile home belonged to, and they found that this mobile home was owned by Gary Bowman. Once the investigators started looking more into Gary, they discovered that he had actually fled to Canada the day after the murders occurred on August 16th, 2002. 
And of course, this is super suspicious. Whenever anyone flees very shortly after a murder has happened, that's always going to be a red flag. While they were looking into Gary, the police received a call from Gary's landlord who told them that a couple of days before the murders, Gary had mentioned to him that he was going to Virginia to visit a man that he had paid to move his mobile home. And remember, this is what Michael Short did for a living. His company moved mobile homes. The landlord went on to say that during this conversation, Gary stated that he had paid this man to move his mobile home but the home wasn't moved yet and Gary was very upset about it. According to the landlord, Gary stated that this man would either need to follow through, move his mobile home like he was supposed to, or he would need to return the money that was paid out to him, or he would have to kill him. After hearing what this landlord had to say, it seems like a great break to this case at this point. They found at least a potential motive if, in fact, Gary was the killer of this family. Also, the landlord claimed that he witnessed Gary having a pistol in his possession the day the Shorts were murdered on August 15, 2002. And with this information provided to investigators, they were able to get a search warrant for both the mobile home and the home he rented from this landlord. And during the search, not a lot was found, but the one thing they did find was a map. And on this map, it had been reported that the location around the Shorts family home had been marked with an X. With Gary currently being in Canada, they decided to start questioning the people that knew Gary. And none of Gary's family or friends thought Gary had murdered the Shorts family. Despite all these suspicious indicators, Indicators, the timing of him fleeing to Canada, the map, the conversation with the landlord. Despite all of this, no one that actually knew Gary seemed to think it was even a possibility that he had been involved. The only derogatory thing that anyone said about him during these interviews was that they were told that Gary abused drinking alcohol and he would drink very frequently throughout the day, every day. There was a friend of Gary's that even claimed that he had been with Gary the night of the murders. He claimed that Gary was so inebriated that night that it would have been impossible for him to travel all the way to Virginia, kill Michael and Mary Short, and abduct Jennifer without him leaving any evidence. But it's no surprise that even after hearing this, police still wanted to talk to Gary. They wanted to talk to him as soon as possible. And it turns out this wasn't going to be very difficult because around this time, Gary had been extradited from Canada back to the United States because he had lied about his prior criminal history. Gary had previous DUIs, which he had not disclosed when he entered Canada. So because of this, he was deported back to the United States. With him being deported back now into the country, the police were finally able to interview Gary. The FBI was able to conduct a full and thorough investigation on him, and with this investigation, they found nothing. Absolutely no evidence whatsoever that could tie him to the Shorts family murders. During the interrogation, Gary was very cooperative, and he immediately and explicitly denied any involvement. He claimed he never even met any of the Shorts family. Gary underwent hours of questioning for this case for several months. He was released from custody very shortly after his deportation, but he was required to return to court in front of a grand jury on November 12th, 2002, in relation to the Schwartz family murders. But Gary was not indicted as there was not enough evidence to even consider charging Gary for this crime. By the year of 2007, Gary Bowman officially was no longer a suspect for this case. No charges were ever filed against Gary for the Shorts family murders. Gary has spoken publicly a few times regarding the Shorts family murder case. In 2004, while speaking to the news and record of Greensboro, Gary stated, quote, This will hang over me for the rest of my life, unless they find the person who did it. Close quote. And Gary was correct. This continued to hang over him for the rest of his life. In December 2014, Gary Bowman did pass away. Another thing I do want to bring up is the corruption within the Henry County Police Force during the time of this case. I've gone over this before in previous cases, where police corruption exists, and although it may not directly link to the Shorts family murder case, I do feel it's important to bring up the fact that in 2007, H.F. Cassell, the sheriff at the time of the Shorts family murders, as well as 12 other deputies from within the Henry County Police Department, were charged with drug distribution and money laundering. They were dealing crack cocaine, marijuana, and ketamine for years. Apparently, they would confiscate the drugs that they found, they would fake destruction orders for these drugs, and then they would resell them. And the former sheriff pleaded guilty to doing this. I will leave a link to an article about this below in the description if any of you want to read more about it. It's absolutely insane. 
reading about this type of corruption going on in any police department is very disheartening to say the least. It angers me quite honestly. They are here to protect and serve the public, not to make profits by selling drugs. And with this coming out, obviously the entire community lost trust with not only the progress of the Shorts family murder case, but with every single case this department has been a part of for the last several years, since Sheriff H.F. Cassell became Sheriff of the Department in 1992. I mean, seriously, how can anyone rely on any of the information that they found during the Shorts case now? I don't know if the drug dealing or money laundering had any effect on this case whatsoever, but it makes you think, would this case have already been solved if there had been no police corruption occurring? Would we know right now who murdered Michael, Mary, and Jennifer Short? I don't know. I can just only hope that the corruption didn't set this case or any other case back for that matter. After Gary had been ruled out as a suspect for the Shorts family murder, the case quickly went cold. Although tips have continued to come through, there has not been a major break in this case for years now. March 18th, 2009, the FBI released a composite sketch of a man that was possibly seen by the Shorts family home right before the murders happened. This man is described to have been in his 40s and had a weathered complexion. It was also reported in May of 2010, FBI agents had spoken to several people in the coastal cities of South Carolina regarding the Shorts family murders. They looked into these cities because this is where Michael had traveled shortly before he had been murdered. As far as we know, nothing concrete or helpful came from these questionings either. On February 20th, 2019, the Short family home at 10820 Virginia Avenue was destroyed by a fire. The entire house was engulfed in flames and it took firefighters several hours to put out this fire. It has not been determined if this fire had any connection to the murder investigation and I couldn't find any information on how exactly this fire even started. Since this fire happened, the case has been pretty quiet. They have continued to keep a lot of details under wraps with the hope that they can and will solve this case. The current sheriff, Lane Perry, on the 20th anniversary of the Shorts family deaths, had announced that they are actively reinvestigating this case from square one. They are re-interviewing people and are even trying to interview Jennifer Short's classmates who had been little kids at the time of the murders and are now in their early 30s. He also would go on to say that over a hundred pieces of evidence had been collected over the years and if anything had not been tested at the time, will now be tested. The department remains super hopeful that they will solve this case one day. I myself do have a lot of hope that this case will be solved. I think this case should have been solved a very long time ago. I can't shake the feeling that if there hadn't been the police corruption going on during the time this case happened, then we would already have the answers to what happened to Michael, Mary, and Jennifer Short. 20 long years have gone by. That's such a long time to go without justice. To go without any answers to what happened. To not even know what the motive behind their murders truly was. I look at their family photo together and I see the happiness in their faces. And my heart just absolutely aches for them. They were just such a sweet and friendly family and none of them deserved what happened to them. I pray one day I can do an update video for the Shorts family and finally reveal the piece of shit that took this family's lives away. But as of right now, that is all I have on this case. Thank you all so much for sticking with me. I know this was a little bit of a longer case, but it is extremely important to cover. Don't forget to like, share, and click that subscribe button. As always, thank you all for the constant support. I will catch you all for case number 13. But until then, bye you guys.